In this lecture, we will discuss the kinetics of intravenous infusions. Starting with front-end kinetics, let's imagine you are working in the intensive care unit. Your patient has just been transferred in the afternoon from theatre, intubated, following major surgery of some description. There's evidence that the patient is very uncomfortable and you decide to start an infusion of fentanyl. This commences at 20 micrograms per hour and you steadily increase it up to 80 micrograms per hour, at which point the patient appears more comfortable and is taking pressure supported breaths. You've titrated your drug carefully and so now you've gotten it just right. The next morning, the patient is not breathing and her eyes look like this. What has gone wrong? A cursory look at this graph here from our old friends Hemmings and Egan demonstrates that the time taken for a drug infusion to reach steady state varies enormously depending upon the drug. For remifentanil it is very quick, but for fentanyl it is a very slow process. In fact it may take many hours to reach anything like steady state. The right way to manage a patient like this would be to administer a bolus of fentanyl, not necessarily a huge one, followed by an increase in the rate of infusion, just like a TCI machine would do. Consider that this has implications for starting patients on fentanyl PCAs. If the patient has been well loaded with fentanyl in the operating theatre, then a fentanyl PCA is likely to be a good choice. However, if you wish to start a young, healthy, large patient on a PCA without any prior loading, then my view is that morphine and oxycodone are likely to be better choices in, for the most part. Let's talk about some rear end kinetics. Let's now imagine that it's 1970 and you're about to anaesthetize a patient for cardiac surgery. You crack open four of these bad boys and you wonder to yourself, how long will they last for? How long will it stop the patient from breathing? How long will it provide analgesia for? The answer is here in this graph from the pharmacology textbook by Evers and Mays, specifically the chapter on opioid kinetics. You can see that a 30 microgram per kilogram bolus will result in apnea for about one and a half hours and effective analgesia for about 10 hours. I encourage you to call to mind at this point what you might have been told about fentanyl, that its peak effect occurs early and it wears off quickly as well. The answer is yes and no. If offset occurs in the distribution phase, as it will for a two microgram per kilogram bolus, then it will be quick. However, if offset is going to occur during the terminal elimination phase, especially if the dose is very big, then that effect can be very long indeed. Once again, I encourage you to consider this graph in the context of PCA prescription. For a fentanyl PCA, each push of the button will last a lot longer in the patient who's received intraoperative loading in, as compared with the patient who hasn't. At risk of stating the obvious, the loading dose doesn't have to, have to be administered all at once. Let's talk about context-sensitive half-time, another favorite topic uh, of anesthetists and examiners. I'd like to share with you this conceptual graph which I learned about from one of my mentors. I haven't been able to find it in a textbook anywhere, but this is how I understand it. The context-sensitive half-time curve of every drug is some variation of this shape. This graph invokes a two-compartment model of sorts. The first plateau represents the distribution half-life, and the length of time it takes to get there on the x-axis is proportional to the central volume of distribution. The final plateau represents the terminal elimination half-life of the drug and the length of time it takes to get there on the x-axis is proportional to the volume of distribution at steady state. This is a diagram depicting the context-sensitive half-times for commonly used drugs. It is very useful for understanding the concept, however the terminal elimination half-lives vary to a confusing degree between the sources. Fentanyl is a good example of this. In Peckin Hill, fentanyl's T half beta is said to be about 190 minutes. Here we can see that it is maybe 300 minutes. Elsewhere, I've seen it stated as high as 450 minutes. Just for argument's sake, we can calculate what we expect fentanyl's T half beta to be based on other kinetic parameters that are more agreed upon. In Peckin Hill, Fentanyl's volume of distribution is said to be 4 litres per kilogram and its clearance 13 millilitres per kilogram per minute. 
If we put those numbers into the equations that we know, then we will calculate that fentanyl's T-half beta is 213 minutes. Peck and Hill's book states that propofol's terminal elimination half-life is between 5 and 12 hours. Here we can see that the contact-sensitive half-time has barely reached 50 minutes after 9 hours of infusion. Honestly, I don't know what to do about these disparities. I think it's best to pick some popular numbers to memorise, but keep in mind that for very slowly equilibrating drugs with very large volumes of distribution, estimates will vary. I would also point out that these values are not solely properties of the drugs. In fact, they vary between patients. In propofol, for example, the context-sensitive half-time has been shown to be longer in children for a given duration of infusion. I expect this is due to accelerated drug distribution. I would also like to impress on you that the context-sensitive half-time is not necessarily the time taken for wake-up. In fact, that's almost certainly not the case. Context-sensitive half-time is also known as the 50% decrement time. In this case, it's the green curve for fentanyl. The other value you may often see stated is the 90% decrement time, and in this case it's so steep up the y-axis that we can't even see it on this graph. Note that the relationship between these decrement times is dependent upon the drug. Here we see the lesser propensity for accumulation of valfentanil, which has a volume of distribution of only 0.6 litres per kilogram, compared with 4 litres per kilogram for fentanyl. Here we see this flattening of the curves to an even greater degree with remifentanil. I don't think anything better illustrates how different fentanyl, alfentanil and remifentanil are with respect to their kinetics than this set of graphs. Here we see the same concept illustrated using volatile anaesthetics. In the top graph, we see a representation of the 90% decrement times for sevoflurane, desflurane and isoflurane. Note that for sevoflurane, this decrement time begins to rise steeply at about the two-hour mark. I would also encourage you to, to consider that desflurane does in fact accumulate, just not as quickly and not to the same extent. You will find in the literature many investigations into the question of whether patients wake up significantly faster from desflurane compared with sevoflurane anesthesia. In my view, that's a foolish question because the answer is, it depends. It depends upon the depth of anesthesia, it depends upon the rate of accumulation, particularly cardiac output, and it depends most of all upon the duration of anesthesia. I've listed here some decrement times for sevoflurane, desflurane, and propofol. The context for this is a short answer question from a few years back when the examiner wanted to make a point that propofol's decrement times skyrocket during prolonged anesthesia in comparison with the volatile agents. Unfortunately, these numbers vary to a large extent. The ones I've listed here are the ones that I learned. Um, they're not all from one particular source, so just be aware of that. In summary, the time taken to reach steady state will vary enormously depending upon the drug. The time to offset of effect will vary depending upon the drug and also upon the dose. The context-sensitive decrement times are more useful than the terminal elimination half-life in determining time to offset of effect. Lastly, offset of effect may not occur after one context-sensitive half-time.